and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Welcome to episode 145. Today we're going to talk about challenges. Challenges. Are yes, you challenging indeed. me? <laughs> no, not, not, not that kind of challenge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I could down this whole cup of coffee right now. Uh, you want to arm wrestle in the middle of this podcast? <laughs> While downing a cup of coffee. Oh, you, So we just did, uh, for the first time, Ryan, uh, as some follow-up, <laughs> we just did a pre-roll episode on YouTube. Yes. So we've, we've got good old Jordan Moore here, the, the new video guy, the new filmmaker on the Minimalist team. And... Uh, we and, and him and, and podcast Sean did uh, on YouTube. We're, we're starting to do once a week on Tuesdays, although we're recording this on a Thursday because Sean and Jordan were both out of town on, in their respective cities with families and so forth. And so um, if you want to check that out, we basically do like the show prep now on on YouTube, five or 10 minutes. We may end up answering some questions. We may talk about the equipment that we're using for our podcast and, and what cameras we're using and what yeah, razor fun. Jordan uses to shave his head. <laughs> uh, all of this will be revealed in time. Um, but Ryan, so so you and I were having this this conversation last week, as so I wrote it down here. I think that's why you're laughing. Yeah, I'm just like I'm looking at. Hold shows. On, don't, don't, that, 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 don't say anything. Okay. Um, I'll, all right. I'll say it after the fact. <laughs> okay. <laughs> why I can't stop smiling and laughing. <laughs> yeah. So so <clears throat> we were sitting down having this this conversation because you, you were going through a challenge, uh, rather coincidentally. And mm -hmm. if you want to talk about that, we could talk about that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that helps me, and we're talking about challenges, often talking about perspective. Mm -hmm. And there were these four scenarios that we just sort of came up with on the spot. But but um, there are things that really resonated with me, especially because I've gone through a lot of hard times with my health the last two years. Yeah. And hopefully, we, uh, if there's time later on, I'll give a health update during the, the right here, right now segment. In fact, let me write that down so I remember. Um, cool. Well, while, you're, while you're writing that down, I will say uh, the reason why these we, that Josh and I were talking about these perspectives was because yes I was having a challenge so I went to you and I'm like dude I'm having this challenge like what uh what can I do to kind of overcome this challenge and yeah you started talking about perspectives and how uh yes looking at looking at your life and and uh, really understanding how the life that we live it's pretty awesome compared to a lot of other people's uh, situations and mm -hmm. circumstances. We're very fortunate. Yes, and we, absolutely. We we're going to continue to have problems. Of course, you want problems because without without those problems, you're not going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. the The ideal thing is like my problems at age 37 are thankfully better than my problems at age 27. Yeah, and which were better than my problems at age 17. Um, and so you and I grew up really poor that 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 presents a particular set of financial problems, but also instability problems with respect to our parents or our families and drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Those are just really bad problems. And then you and I had the corporate problems throughout our 20s, right? Yeah, we we, we, we had these problems of oh, I'm working too many hours. I mean, what, what a privilege it is to be able to work too many hours, right? But it's doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And even now, um, we, we have problems. It's like, oh, you know, what? the camera that we order doesn't come with the uh, appropriate lens cap or whatever. <laughs> like, my dad won't talk to me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, yeah, yeah, just different problems. <laughs> Those are two different problems for sure. <laughs> uh, you want to talk about that, and then we'll talk about some perspective stuff. Um, and then we'll dive about into the some questions. Let's, let's talk about the perspective stuff first, and then I can kind of talk about. Well, I, it doesn't matter where we start. Where do you want to start? You want me to start? I'll start. Well, well, you want yeah, start? you can't. You, you came to me and said, "Hey, uh, you know, you and I, we had a really good podcast about parents." Yes, I think it was episode one forty two. Does that sound right, Sean? Yeah, Jordan? that's about yeah. right. It was a great episode. I kind of, you know, put everything on the. Table table with my relationship with my dad had a funeral for the relationship that right. you wished you had and it really was healing uh like i felt better afterwards but uh i came to you talking about how i was waking up on a regular basis angry uh -huh. very very angry at daily um, yeah every single day waking up angry at man if it wasn't just for uh you know my dad's uh beliefs or the if it wasn't for the organization that he follows like him and I could have this really good relationship and it would make me angry mm. because 
I had this in my head, like, oh man, if, if he would just only, if he would just only do this one thing, or if he would just only see this one point, then him and I could have this amazing relationship. And it's it, that podcast that we had, it was a great podcast. And I feel like, I feel like it was, um, uh, it was very therapeutic uh -huh. and, um, it was, I'm, I'm sure that it helped some people, but the problem that I had with that episode was, I didn't, I still didn't have a clear answer. Right. Like I had an answer that was helping me move forward, but I didn't have a clear answer. And um, waking up every morning angry, that is an indicator. Mm -hmm. That was an indicator for me, like something is wrong. I have to, every single morning, go through these perspectives. And that's where you and I started talking about this. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, basically wake up every morning and I'd have to sit there and and deal with this anger that I had. Well, let's talk and the way and the way that uh, go ahead talk about what I was gonna, uh, because you had a longer term solution. I think to me I parse this out and I really like both ingredients here. These perspectives that, that I want to talk about here, there are four different perspectives that I presented to you. Mm -hmm. They are helpful in the short term. Correct. Like, to help you like like okay, realize it's not as bad as I'm as I'm playing up in my mind. Right. But then there's also a longer term solution that you talked about with your therapist and we, we, we can talk through that as well. Sure. Uh, let's get to the short term stuff because I think what's important is like how do we change our state right now? Mm -hmm. And then what well, then we let's talk about how do we change it longer term. How do we change a long term perspective? Yes. And so the short term perspective, you know, for me it was something as simple and we talked about this on a podcast. I was having a, a crappy morning a few podcasts ago. Like the morning just wasn't going well and and like I didn't sleep well. And then like there was all these I wanted to get to the office earlier to prepare more and it just didn't happen. But then I almost stepped in this huge pile of dog shit <laughs> and that's why i'm laughing ladies and gentlemen <laughs> yes. is because i'm looking down at the the show notes he, josh here. does a really nice job preparing these notes before every podcast and the show starter the first note on there is dog shit <laughs> <laughs> so 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 you almost uh, stepped in dog shit right and and i re i realized that day like okay it's a shitty morning but it could be literally shittier mm -hmm. because i could have stepped in dog shit. and then last week i'm walking in uh, down my hallway and no one in my apartment on my floor has a dog that I'm aware of, but there is just dog shit all over the hallway. Wow. And, and like these huge, it looks like, you know, some mastiff was there or something. But the funny thing is I saw this really old woman, maybe in her like mid eighties, getting on the elevator as I was getting off. And she had this like dog that was, you know, it wasn't a very big dog. It had to be this dog. And she just didn't notice that he was just crapping, crapping all, over, all yeah. over the hallway. And, and it's like, that's terrible, but it could have been worse. It can I can always, be I could have, yeah. you know, I could have fallen in it. I could have be on my shoe or whatever. And that's, that's the sort of funny perspective change. Just realizing like, no matter how bad something is, it could be worse. You could have stepped in dog shit, but then there are other like serious perspective, perspective shifts. Um, you and I were talking about, there's a, a, a pastor who I follow on social media. His name is Judah Smith. He, he runs a, a church in Seattle. Um, and I really like some of the, the, the stories that he tells and he talks about these, these perspectives that we, we have and how we set ourselves up for disappointment. He was giving the story about, um, a friend of his, um, Michael Porter Jr. Who, who was drafted in, in the most recent NBA draft. Mm. Uh, and now a year ago, or maybe even six months before the draft, he was projected to be number one in the draft, like mm -hmm. just really solid basketball player. And well, they're fairly certain he's going to go number one. If he didn't go number one, he was definitely going to be in the top two or three, yeah. but pretty sure he's going to be number one. Mm -hmm. But as the draft comes around, uh, they, people find out he has a slight back injury. Mm -hmm. And so he starts to become more questionable, even though he's one of the best players going into the draft that year. And, and so the draft night comes around and Judah's all happy because he's like, oh, we're going to get drafted tonight, even though, you know, I mean, he's a 40-year-old guy in Seattle who right. doesn't play <laughs> basketball. Um, but he's like, oh, my, you know, it's like if if you were going to be in the NBA draft or I was going to be in the NBA draft, all of a sudden we'd be really excited for each other, right? And and you would feel like you were being drafted into the NBA Absolutely. if I was. Yes. And I still have hopes. I'm, I'm still holding out. Me too, man. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> I'm still excited for you. I'm waiting for the Utah Jazz to call any day now. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, the draft night comes around, and first pick, he doesn't get drafted. Second, third pick, doesn't get drafted. And they're like, okay, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Make it down to the top seven. You know, the top seven are like the really good players. Doesn't get drafted in the top seven. Mm. 
make it to a nine, ten. Now the lottery only has fourteen players in it, and then beyond that, it's just a, a sequential thing. But mm. uh, so they make it to number twelve, doesn't get drafted. Number thirteen doesn't get drafted, and then for the fourteenth pick, the Denver Nuggets picked Michael Porter Jr. Mm. and and all of a sudden it's like. Oh wow! This guy was supposed to be number one. Yeah, he had this high. Everyone had this expectation for him. Everyone who knew him was like, "You're going to be the top draft pick of of uh, of the year." Expectations. Yeah, man. I'll the, tell you what, they they are crippling. They right, will set us up. And so they're interviewing him afterward, and it's it's almost like this backhanded compliment. It's like, oh, you got drafted, but isn't it disappointing that you didn't make it to number one? And he just looked at the person interviewing, and he was like, "Oh no, like." I I don't deserve anything. Mm -hmm. Like I I think it's just a blessing that I get to be here. I get to play in the NBA next year. Yeah. How awesome is that? Yeah. And shifting that around to like, wow, the standard here is I get to play in the NBA. By the way, I'm a first round draft pick. How awesome is that? I love that dude. He doesn't deserve anything. It's like I feel like uh, a lot of a lot of my woes came from. These, these expectations I had, mm -hmm. these things that I felt I deserved, mm -hmm. or worse, felt that I was entitled to. Yes, yes. And uh, I just, that's a beautiful example of how the less we feel we're entitled to, mm -hmm. the lower our expectations are, but the higher the standards, yes. we can take this experience that, yeah, everyone else is looking at, oh, poor you, we're so sorry for you, and we don't have to necessarily feel that way. And his standard is, I'm going to play basketball to the best of my ability, yeah. regardless of what the the outcome is with yeah, what draft pick I am. Right. Because here's the thing, I mean, the, the rookie of the year, one of the rookies of the year last year, played for the Utah Jazz, Donovan Mitchell, mm -hmm. and I think he was drafted 27th. Wow. And and now everyone's like, man, he should have been first or second. Right. And and all you have to do is prove yourself with the high standards. Yeah. Because otherwise, you have say you get drafted. How many people have been drafted number two or number three or even number one, and they amounted to nothing? It Dude, happens every year. Don't get me much. started on the Bengals. <laughs> right. There My you go. My God. And, and I think that's the point. Is like you have high expectations for these people, but if they don't have the standards, if it doesn't work out, then it, what's it worth anyway? Yeah. And so I think sometimes, right, we, when we talk about what you deserve, what you're entitled to, I think with, with your parents, a situation with your situation with your dad mm -hmm. is maybe there were times where you felt you see other people with great parents yeah like i think about my partner rebecca and she like grew up on this you know, idyllic childhood with two parents who stayed married they're still married right now yeah lived on a farm middle class and like you're like i should be i, I should have that too we're entitled to that right like, that's what I should have. No, you shouldn't have anything. Yeah. You're I lucky mean, enough to be here. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, if if we're entitled to anything, um, so I ask this question to people all the time because it is an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it, but I do think that we probably are born with some entitlements. And I've heard people say, uh, when I ask them the question, like, what do you think we're entitled to? Mm -hmm. People will say, um, oh, you know, what clean water mm -hmm. or maybe clean air, mm -hmm. which we, we you have to fight for that stuff. I mean, yeah. we hardly get that. But but the best answer I got was this dude in Ireland uh -huh. um, back when uh, Mariah and I were there and I think it was like September of 2015, maybe God, was so long ago. Um, but uh, I asked him, we're sitting at the pub and I'm like, you know, I got a question I like to ask people and you seem like you'd have a good answer to this. What do you feel like we are born entitled to? What, when we are born on this earth, what are we entitled to? And he looked at me and he was like, peace. Mm. To be left alone. And yeah. I was like, dude, that is good, man. Like yeah. that is that is absolutely good. But, but, but to your point though of entitlements, like there's nothing that we are born into this world that says you have to have this, you need to have that, you are entitled to have this. Right. Uh, and and yes, that goes with, with having awesome parents. Like I really wish I had awesome parents like Mariah has or like Bex has. I wish that we had these awesome flourishing relationships and they've gotten better over the years. Sure. Um, but like with my mom, like I am connecting with her in a way that I never thought that we would actually be able to connect. Um, with my dad, it's, it's kind of going the opposite way. But my point is, is that uh, I can work towards having good parents and I can put that on me and do as much work as I can and support them as much as I can and, and be a good son as much as I can. But just because I show them respect, just because I go out of my way to appreciate, accept them, to support them, doesn't necessarily mean that I'm entitled to get it back. Now, I get to choose how, how much energy and how much 
uh, of my resources I put into those relationships. Right. But just because I do X, Y, and Z, yes, there's a possibility that A, B, and C will happen, but nothing, nothing in this world entitles A, B, and C to happen. Yeah, and even the things you talked about with, I mean, to me, I, I would love to think that uh, it's a right that we have clean air, clean water, and peace. Mm -hmm. Like to me, those seem like fundamental, but right. there are plenty of cavemen who didn't have access to clean water or the air yeah. was messed up because a meteor hit or whatever. Yeah, they weren't even even back then. They weren't entitled to it. And peace, sure. by the way, human existence has been violent for all of human history until very recently. Yeah, we're, we're, we're if you go to uh, uh, who was it was it? I think it's uh, Stephen Pinker. Um, uh, uh, Enlightenment Now is that, is that the book um, yeah so in there he writes about how if you go to South Side Chicago and mm. it's extremely violent, violent or you go to Over the Rhine in Cincinnati in the late 90s uh, second most violent neighborhood in the country you go to West Dayton today or you go to um, any 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 neighborhood in North America that is a developed, we're a very you know, developed, relatively peaceful nation, but there are neighborhoods that are extremely violent. It's over yeah. 600 people were, were killed in South South Chicago last year. Yeah. Um, if you go out throughout human history, that was actually the norm. Right. South South Chicago was the norm throughout human history. It's what, crazy. The anomaly is us right now. Like we're we're here and we're here in Los, a safe part of Los Angeles. Yeah, it's funny to think, man. This is the safest time in human history right Absolutely. now. Absolutely, like it is the most peaceful time. There there is one war going on right now in the Western Hemisphere. Right, it's like the drug war with like I don't I don't know where somewhere in South America that's going okay. on. But besides that, yeah. I mean, it is this is one of the most peaceful times in in history for sure. And so the things we think of as an, uh, of as anomalies now, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. We don't. We're not even entitled to peace, even though we we feel like we should be, right? Yeah. And again, that helps well, change the perspective a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to differentiate. When I say peace, I don't mean like peace on earth. Uh -huh. I, I do mean being left alone, right, right. as as far as that goes. But you're right. Like even even that point. Um, th maybe some people go and you know go into uh, move into a cabin on the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere, Montana, <laughs> and they are left alone. But by and large, you're right, man. Like that is not something that every single person on this earth can can expect. Yeah, and even th they will not be left alone. You yeah. try, try not to pay your taxes if right. you're living in that in that That's cabin. True. Absolutely, you will be forced into a violently into a jail jail cell. Yeah. Um. And so, um, we even that we're not. And so it it just really shifts our perspective on on entitlements, right? Mm -hmm. Now the next thing that I, I saw was on Joe Rogan's podcast. That you and I were talking about a guy named Michael Scott Moore. He mm -hmm. wrote a book about. For almost three years, I think it was two years and eight months, he was captured by Somali pirates. It's crazy. 2014, I think, is when this happened. And so, yeah. uh, and he was certain he was going to die, basically, because they, they wanted $20 million uh, in order to return him. And he's, he's just a journalist. You know, he's like, I don't make any money. Like, Didn't you say he laughed? He, when, when they said $20 million, call, <laughs> they're like, call your close relative, tell them you want $20 million. And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> they're like it's not funny and yeah um and i mean the first thing they did was they, they broke his hand they hit him in the face with a with a shotgun butt or ak-47 butt or whatever and, and and basically fed him crap and uh like he developed um all kinds of like autoimmune issues and i mean wow. he was dying essentially yeah and then eventually he he's able to get out through a whole negotiation process and and now he's like i mean he went through and probably still does go through traumatic PTSD yeah. um, and has recovered mostly, but even like sleeping at night is difficult for him. But he's like, I realize now like the things that used to make me upset, like getting stuck in traffic. Right. Um, like you, it could be worse. You could be kidnapped by Somali pirates. Yeah. I like, this is <laughs> and great. Have your hands broken. Yeah. This is great compared to, yeah. And every night they chained him to a bed. Good God. And so like, it's hard for him to sleep because like, he gets anxiety around like if it's nighttime, that means that's the time where I'm getting chained to a bed yeah. and I may or may not get beaten tonight. Wow. And so that perspective shift, just thinking about that is like, oh yeah. And then the, the last story that you and I talked about, and this was really unfortunate, um, Jay Alston from our documentary, Minimalism, uh, Tiny House Guy, uh, last week was killed by ISIS. It sounds so weird like to... Yeah, I mean, we only got to see him a couple times, and I, I, I mean, I, I've communicated with him via email and text, mm -hmm. and I always thought, like, oh, I'd 
you know, hang out whenever we go to DC or if he was in DC at the same time. Yeah. So he and his, his wife or, or, or partner, they decided that we're going to travel the world. We're going to bike around. They're really passionate about biking and they've done long bike trips before and they wanted to go around the world on a bike trip. Right. And so they decided, Hey, now's the time They quit their jobs. He, he, uh, had someone take care of his tiny house for him. That same tiny house that's in the documentary. Yeah. And they've been blogging about their experience and sharing on Instagram, taking photos on day 365. They're in the country. It's not Turkmenistan. It's the country right next to it, right above Afghanistan. Um, starts with a T I, I forget the name. Um, it's all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of the ministans. <laughs> <laughs> Insert the word here, Sean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, he'll, he'll fix it no, up no, Sean, Sean uh, or, um, uh, Jordan on the on the uh, episode will put the name of the country on the, right. the YouTube video. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> right and, here. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he was he and his his girlfriend were, were or wife were were biking with um, five other people. It's a group of seven of them biking through the country. It's just absolutely gorgeous. So mm-hmm. looking at the pictures, but it was also really difficult that their journey was difficult. You know, it's cold sometimes and hot and they're, they're backpacking and they're on their bikes and they get flat tires and yeah. people accidentally run them off the road sometimes because there's different customs in different countries. Anyway, they're with this, this pack of seven people on their bicycles and all of a sudden a, a van just swerves and hits all seven of them off the road. They get out of the van and just start stabbing them to death. It's unbelievable. It's so tragic, man. And my heart goes out to all of his family and friends. I mean, that's such a tragic thing. Yeah. And I was, I was talking to someone, uh, someone from the New York times reached out to me and was just asking me about him. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to her on, on the phone about it. And she, I was, I was both grateful like that we had the opportunity to to know him but i was also grateful we had the opportunity to like to live this this dream this mm. this passion of his it's so unfortunate that it led to what it led to but he lived the last year of his life doing what they wanted to do and it wasn't easy no it was it was difficult but it was simple and they, they chose to leave behind a life that was not fulfilling and live that last year. And it reminded me of our friend Stan. I and mean, we've actually done an episode about, about Stan that me, you, and, and, and podcast Sean, we all worked with back in the corporate world. One of, one of our closest friends. Yeah. And um, he died at, at thir- was he 36 or 37? He was, I think, 36. Yeah. Yeah, and Mid-30s, we, yeah. He yeah, was, we, and he, he, had a, he had a heart attack. Tragically and, young, yeah. And, and died. And... Um, but he like he lived a life that a lot of people wouldn't have lived at all, and like yeah. in that attenuated life, there was real life. It was real living. Yeah. And so the essay, and we'll put a link to the essay in, in the show notes. It's called "Live Like Stan," and it it is it was sort of a, a tribute to his life, but realizing like wow, like Jay or like Stan, like we can die any any day, yeah, yeah. any moment. Yeah. No. So these these perspectives um, and many other perspectives that that I I would use to kind of get over that anger that I was feeling in the morning it helped mm-hmm. and, it, and temporarily it's, yeah it helps it helps reframe the day but when I talked to you about it I was at a point where uh, reframing was not working uh-huh. it, it was it was working but it was working less and less you can't keep putting band aids on the wound right and I feel like I'd wake up in the morning I'd be angry I put a band aid on it. Uh-huh. And then, like, the band-aids start to come off. And then I'd put, like, another band-aid on it. Right. And then by the end of the day, I just got these layers of band-aids. So continue that metaphor. It's You have to bandage the wound before you can get to the hospital, so to speak. Sure. And these perspective shifts are the, the temporary band-aids yeah. that help out. But let's talk about the long-term perspective shift. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, long story short, man, I uh, got a hold of a therapist, a referral through our physician, Dr. Ryan Green. And, um, dude, it's funny, like one hour of therapy, like how it really helped me reframe mm-hmm. the way I looked at the relationship. So up until this point, it was, I, I don't talk a lot about my upbringing with Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't talk about Jehovah's Witnesses too much because I really want to respect people's beliefs mm-hmm. and I really want to respect people's values. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, tr- I, I don't, I try to not talk about that organization, the Watchtower and Track Society, I try to not talk about that in a negative light because it, it's just like any other religion in the sense that it has you know a group of people with a, a, belief, a set belief of dogmatics, or am I repeating myself there? But they, they have these- there's, there's an ideology. Yeah, there's an ideology 
and and it works for my dad and that's great but i always looked at the reason why i'm prefacing it is because i always looked at the problem with my dad and i was this society yeah. and i would always tell myself man if it wasn't for the watchtower on track society if it wasn't for their interpretation of the bible um then my dad and i would have a really really great relationship and that is where i was getting stuck for two reasons. One, I don't want to look at any organization and be and and feel uh, anger or or um, resentment. Yeah. Um. And and plus, that doesn't feel right to me anyway. To like sit yeah. there and blame um, an organization. Oh, the organization is making my dad do this. Right. Like that just doesn't feel right to me. So sure. talking this through with the therapist, yeah, it was it was great, man. He just helped me to kind of realize that. Um, yeah, man, like my dad, it, it, he is who he is. Right, right, right. And like the the religion that he is in, mm -hmm. he uses he uses that as a tool to be a bad dad. He's a bad dad who uses the the religion to bludgeon you. But if it right. weren't for the religion, he would find something else to bludgeon me with. And well, the thing too is like, well, it, the, the 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 therapist was like there are other people in this religion that are in similar circumstances to what you and your father are in, right? Mm. And he's like, and, and they, they're they still able to maintain decent relationships with their kids, right? And I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, this is not, this is not a, uh, this is, the, the, yeah, the organization is not a, the problem. It, it, it is a symptom of who my dad really is, right. if, if that makes any sense. He's, he's looking for the problem. Right. So, so yeah, long story short, um, it feels like it's just having that one hour conversation. That was on Monday. So today's Thursday. This is just four days ago. I haven't woken up angry one time. I mean, I do wake up and like it hurts and I'm like, God, I wish like I could just call my dad and be like, Hey, love you, man. How's it going? When are we going on that scuba diving trip? Yeah. But, but like I, you know, uh, will wake up and like have those random thoughts. Um, but instead of me getting angry, cause I used to just be like, Oh, if you would just see, if he would just, if he would just see how misled he is, and 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 it's like, I don't have that anymore because it's not about him being misled. Right. It's just about him being a bad dad. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's okay, man. Like, I. It's funny because I've always. Well, it's okay because you're not entitled to a good dad. Yeah, and you know, I, I always looked at like the relationship with uh, my mother, um, uh, back in the eighth grade when it just you know shit hit the fan with 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 uh th that side of of my, of my family um i got blamed yeah as in junior high i got blamed for a lot of what happened and i was able and i was able to in junior high look at the relationship with my mom and be like you know what i don't know why i'm being blamed for this stuff right now i don't know why any of this is my fault in fact it's not my fault and it turns out that you know, my mom's perspective is just wrong and she's just not able to be a good parent right now. Mm -hmm. And I was able to move on. And it's like, I don't know why it took me till 37 years old to realize that with my dad, but it was through this therapy session that totally helped me to kind of, to just accept that really. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I guess the other thing to get out of this whole experience and the reason why I'm sharing it is because if, if there is someone out there who is waking up with a with you know some kind of pain or some kind of angst on a regular basis um yeah the temporary band-aids will work well temporarily mm -hmm. um it is so important to go get the help that you need and it's and, and it's not like like our conversations help mm -hmm. um in fact when people uh when people reach out to me for mentoring mm -hmm. a lot of the times they will tell me hey ryan i know i have a lot of good friends to talk to and family to talk to but I know what uh, what your personality is like. I respect your opinion and your advice. So I just want to get an unbiased opinion on a matter. Right. So I could, you know, with, with someone that I respect. Yeah. And it was the same thing with a therapist. It's like, I want to, you know, well, <laughs> yeah, the other thing, yeah, I wanted to talk to someone who I respected and uh, he was a great recommendation from Dr. Ryan Green who like really talked him up. But the other thing too is like, I'm thinking, all right, Ryan, I have got the typical the stereotypical like Freud mommy and daddy issues. Hmm. So <laughs> why don't I go and do the stereotypical treatment for it? Right. And it turns out like it's, 
it's a stereotype for a reason. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it was helpful. And guess what? If it wasn't helpful, you wasted an hour of your life and, and a little deal. bit of money. Yeah. And uh, at least you're one step closer to figuring out what the long term perspective shift is. So, what the reason I I bring these these two different solutions up is getting the short term perspective shift is important as long as you're willing to do something about it long term as well. And so finding. It, it, finding what that change is for you, it could be as simple as as reframing the mm -hmm. idea that like it's not a bad religion necessarily, it's a bad parent. Yeah, it's it was yeah it was reframing the the way I looked at my dad. Like instead of using something else to blame for my dad and I's relationship, mm -hmm. being able to look at my dad and just be like, dude, this is not, it has nothing to do with religion. This has nothing to do with the Watchtower and Track Society. This has everything to do with you as a person. Because yeah, if it weren't for religion, he would use geography or money or any other excuse to, to beat you over the head with that, right? right. Um, and, and any other sort of resource or ideology that, that it was useful in because you, the conversation you and I had, like even when you were growing up and you were being a a good Jehovah's Witness. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. He, going out, going door to door on a regular basis, making every it to weekend. every single uh, every single meeting, which is uh, just another term for going to church. And and dude, like when I was there, I think they cut it back. Um, but when I was there, it was like three days a week, mm. going for an hour or two hours. Um. Yeah, I was doing everything I was supposed to do, and even then, he found fault. Still found a way. How so? Tell, oh, dude. Whether it was because I was working for him at the time, mm -hmm. so there's always you know writing me at work with every little thing that he could find. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just insert random not in a loving wallpaper. Way. No, not in a loving way. Not in a way that helps you grow. Yeah, I mean, just you know any any random excuse you could think of in a wallpaper and painting business to like criticize someone. Like he was just right on top of it. And I understand it because this he is raising his standards for me. Mm -hmm. And I and I understand that um you know he's going to try and get me to to get to those standards. Yeah. But to your point, the standards that he's trying to get to trying to get me to now, I was already there. Right. And he still was a bad dad. And I think about my sister, it's the same thing. I mean she was doing you know, it's like <laughs> my dad would be like, okay, uh you need to to my sister, you need to go you need to go door to door more. So then she would. And then he'd be like, okay, that's great. Uh, you're doing good, but you need to go even more now. So then she upped her hours uh, to, you know, 30 hours a month or 40 hours. I forget what it, like what the, what the, what the, the time frame is that they require to, to, they call it, uh, what, what, I'm not going to get into the jargon, but my point is, is that, so then, yeah, she go out door to door more. And then my dad would be like, that's great. Now, uh, make sure that you are dating someone when she got to the age to, to date. Make sure you're dating someone that is uh, is in the Watchtower and Track Society. So then she would. Great. She found someone who was in the Watchtower and Track Society. Well, it turns out he wasn't he wasn't enough of, of, of a uh, person for her to date because he wasn't an elder in the in the in the church or he was. So there was always there was always this standard mm -hmm. that my dad would have. We meet it and then he raises it. And right. that is a symptom of him. That is not a symptom of anything else. Which, by the way, is great if you are raising standards for a reason. That's what we should be doing. Sure. But when we have these arbitrary standards, they're not even standards anymore, it becomes an unrealistic expectation. Yeah. And, and it's always going to be the next thing that is out of reach. I'm always going to find something that is out of reach for you. Yeah. It's, it's the, oh, you can dunk on a 13-foot rim? How here's about, here 14 Here's 13 rim. and a half. Yeah, dude. It's, it's always like raising that bar but dude it's it's totally okay to raise one standards it's okay for me to raise my standards I'll, I'll raise my standards every day if i can but i will never raise your standards for you mm. i will never go out of my way to make you feel bad yeah because i've set a standard for you in my head and you're not there yeah. like you're my best friend dude like i will support you no matter what yeah. and if you need help if you ask me for help with your standards that you set for yourself great i'll help you but i'm not going to come to you and say these are my standards and you're not living up to them and you should feel bad about it man that sounds like a whole lot of shitty relationships yeah dude. a lot of shitty relationships that's why they're shitty is because we try to impose our standards our beliefs our resources our desires our, our and even our values onto other people yeah and when we do that it, it, not only are we it's not setting the example because that's not what your dad was doing was, i'm going to set the example for you in right. fact it was often the opposite yeah it was is is do as i say not as i do yeah and and by doing that by by 
by trying to impose my value, even if I'm living up to them, if I impose it on you, you're not, it, it's, it's the thing that I always say is, you know, people don't hate change. They hate being changed. Right. And because we all like certain change, like, oh, I got a promotion at work or wow, we got a new podcast studio. That's a change. Like those yeah. are changes that we eagerly embrace because we went after it right yeah. uh whereas the difference is if someone says all right guys all right the minimalists we're putting you in a new podcast studio I'm like wait what yeah like, or or you know you're getting a dem demotion at work or whatever like uh in fact i took a demotion at work once remember i i i, I eliminated the job that i was in so i yeah. could go back into another job that was more ideal for me yeah and uh that was great, but if someone were to force me into it, it's like being changed. We don't like being changed. And so right. trying to change someone is never going to work, at least yeah. not long term. You know, it's funny, man. I, I support people's values and beliefs as much as possible mm -hmm. and go out of my way to not just support but appreciate the differences in people's values and beliefs. But what I don't support is when it is affecting the well-being of other people. Absolutely. Like that's where that's where I will step up and be like, "Hey, you're insane." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so well, f first off, thank you for sharing that story. I think we should probably dive into some of these questions. Yeah, man, here. it's going to be another 3-hour long podcast. <laughs> All right, our first question is from Elise in Richmond, Virginia. I'm embarrassed to say that it's taken me this long to realize that minimalism isn't about stuff. A decluttered home isn't my end goal here. A focused and value-driven life is and i realized this last week the decluttering the trips to goodwill the reduced use of my cell phone for mindless activities all of those were easy for me and i'm daunted by the idea of pushing forward to alter my negative habits and treat my time as a valuable resource spent investing in my well-being and the well-being of others so i'm hoping to glean some encouragement from your own experiences have either of you struggled with certain aspects of minimalism? And if so, why? And how did you overcome them? All right, so so Ryan, she, she said that minimalism isn't about the stuff. Right. I agree with that, but I also think it's an important first step. Yeah. It, it is, minimalism is sort of a, a response to this overindulgent consumerism. It It is an old solution from the stoics and the Thousands major years ago. major world religions yeah. and the transcendentalists like Thoreau and Emerson uh, Emerson and and so it is an old solution to a new problem and that problem is is this excess that we're we're dealing with right mm. and, and and she said like decluttering or her home isn't the end goal I think for some people it is, and that's okay. Yeah. Like that could be the end goal, and ultimately it will lead to other benefits. You might feel calmer, it's easier to clean your house, or you have more time, or you have more money, you have more resources, or you just feel better. Yeah. And and that can be a fine end goal. Now for her, what she's saying is she wants to go beyond that, right? And and so she she mentioned time as a resource. Mm -hmm. Now you and I. We talk all the time about time and attention being your most precious resources. And mm -hmm. you and I have had a few conversations on it. So I've been working on finishing up this essay and it's not done yet. Although by the time this podcast comes out, it will be on our website. Cool. But um, I wanted to read this and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on these five resources. Now, the version that you read on our website will probably be a little bit different from this once podcast Sean copy edits it. But it's called Your Five Most Pre Precious Resources. A simple life involves, perhaps above anything else, the deliberate use of resources, which is why we fashioned a handy acronym to help you identify and budget your most precious resources. And that acronym is STEAM, S-T-E-A-M. And the first resource is uh, skills. So skills. You may possess certain inborn talents like hawking strength, graceful agility, or a beautiful voice, but your talent is blunted if you don't develop it into useful skills. To get good at anything, to create something significant requires competence, which is developed slowly, day after day, with rigor, drudgery, and practice until eventually you've wedded a skill. Sure, your innate talent might make it easier to sharpen your skills, but the work is still required. Hard work, which is why honed skills are in are infinitely more valuable than wasted talent. Besides, is there anything more disappointing than unskilled talent? 
So, so think about that for like we all we all have like certain skills. Like you know someone who is just like a good basketball player by nature. Yeah. I think of my brother as an example. Like he lacked the discipline. He and I just had we were, we were hanging out in Louisville after our Louisville tour stop a few weeks ago, and um, we, I was talking to him. Uh, his his partner Sarah, who he's been with for ten years, they just had a kid together, and um, they uh, uh, she's like, so tell me about. Jerome as a kid I'm like he, he was like crazy athletic mm. and l- completely lacked the discipline that he needed to like hone that wow. into a skill like he had talent he was dunking in the seventh grade that wow. is a talent yeah um I could get the rim once upon a time um but I couldn't dunk a- and um a- and so for me like I I saw that and and he didn't hone it into a skill though right mm. and to me like that's always the most disappointing thing where you have someone who has this talent you could be so amazing yeah like, i remember we played we played on a church basketball league in the eighth grade and he would drop 40 points a game sometimes <laughs> that's great and and like just because he could mm. um and and but didn't like oh, he didn't want to go to practice every day to play on the high school team and he just didn't want, want and and I look at that and I'm like there are other people who don't have that talent but they're willing to put in the work to, to have the to, to develop this enough skills to be good enough to at least play right yeah. and you need both to be in a level like the NBA level you need both the talent and the skills but skill is, is this resource that we all are able to have just like money, we can all have money. You can go work for an hour and make at least you know, $7.50. That's a resource. $7.50 would be that resource. Mm-hmm. A skill is the same thing. You work for an hour, 10 hours, 100 hours, 10,000 hours to develop the skill set. And then all of a sudden you have that resource. And, and that is a resource you've developed. That as long as you keep using it, it doesn't necessarily go away. Mm-hmm. I think about really great stand-up comics. We're going to go see some comedy tonight. Yeah. Tom Segura is going to be there and uh, Christina P. And uh, uh, Chris D'Elia, yeah. Mark Maron. Yeah. These are people who have put in their 10,000 hours. They've yeah. developed a skill. Yeah. And they can get rusty over time if they stop using it. But they've developed that skill. It's not a talent. They just, oh, I'm gonna get on stage, and all of a sudden I've got this. There might be some people. Uh, uh, Dave Chappelle apparently, like since day one, has been like good in front of a crowd. Yeah. Uh, but very rarely does that happen. Yeah. And so that's a resource that we have that we don't think about. Elise is talking about wasting her time as a resource, but also think about like what does that 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 time resource get you you could use that to hone a skill Mm -hmm. for the longest time you and i worked in the corporate world Mm -hmm. and we developed a particular skill set of uh, some of it was about running a business and that's still helpful for us today there's a lot of things that transferred over from there absolutely maybe you know 10 to 20 percent of it but but a lot of it was like wasted uh, developing skills that we we didn't necessarily need or want to develop, sure. right? Yeah. Learning manipulation and mm-hmm. um, learning you know, way too much about data measurement and mm-hmm. and, and these brand th- recognition. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and things that we're kind of allergic to now. It, yeah. It's like a skill we developed and realized like I have an allergy to that skill. Right, right. Um, right. And and so I think it's really important to think about what else can I do with what what are the skills that I can develop? Because that is a resource that is going to keep on giving. It is an asset for you. Mm-hmm. Once you've developed that skill, I mean, you and I, this is podcast episode 145, mm-hmm. but really this is episode 202 because mm-hmm. we've done 67 postscript episodes mm. as well for the Patreon supporters. Yeah. So, so we've done over 200 podcast episodes, yeah. not to mention all the live podcasts that we haven't released. Yeah, or the ones that we recorded and... And never, to, released, and never and never released them yeah yeah and and in that time we were able to wet a skill that that um you go back and listen to episode two yeah it's not nearly as good although we had had several years of speaking experience before then it, some of that translates to being on the mic but now we're able to, have to sit here and have a conversation or stand here i should say and have a conversation yeah. and, and and be much more comfortable with doing that on a microphone yeah and that is a skill that only happens over time. There are some people who have the gift of gab, 
Uh, you're one of them, I think. Uh, I, I certainly am not. <laughs> not on this podcast. <laughs> That's not true. I, but, but I mean, part of it has to do with with knowing when to speak and when it's appropriate. Or whatever. There are other people who have the gift, of, the the gift of gab, and it's the curse of gab. Really, <laughs> they're, they're they're just speaking, speaking, speaking. Like uh, Bex and I were eating at this uh, restaurant, Fish One Hundred One, down in Encinitas the other day. Yeah. And this guy next to us, he was just talking to everyone. And he can either take that talent that he has. And uh, in fact, after when I, when I left, I'm like, this guy will either hone that into a skill where he's going to be great at selling something. Hopefully it's something meaningful. Mm-hmm. Like I, I saw him talking to this older couple. I wouldn't have been surprised if by the end of the night he's in their house selling them real estate or something. <laughs> or he's going to take that, that same talent and he's going to be at a bar every night talking about his woes to everyone who right. will maybe listen to him yeah. and that's what talent gets you it gets you either like you can keep using that talent in a non-skilled way or you can you can develop it you can sharpen it into a skill yeah and and i think that's that's really important especially when she talks about her her values all right the next the next um uh resource here in this acronym steam s-t-e-a-m is time it's striking that we'll refuse to pay a couple bucks to listen to a podcast but then we'll hand over hours of our day willy-nilly to anyone who provides us with, quote, free content. <laughs> but of course, free isn't actually free if you're spending your time. There's no refund on poorly spent time. Yeah, amen. So spend it wisely. That's one of those resources that is not renewable, right? You can spend it developing a skill or you can yeah. spend it you know, just wasting it all day at a, a you know, at a bar or doing drugs or you know, whatever it happens to be. And there's nothing wrong with periodic pacification. And we're going to talk about sure. that a little bit later. But but if, it, if it's leading to... Um, wasted time like all the time and you're not doing anything with it it reminded me of this cartoon i have here ryan this is from the new yorker i'll give this to you jordan after or maybe you can put it on the youtube video there's a there's like some corporate guys in suits but they're all like they have you see it there they, they have a describe that to me um it is it looks like a band uh-huh that their whole shtick is dressing up like they work in the corporate world and what's the catch uh? Are you ready to engage with rock-based content? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I got a New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> so, Jordan, I'll hand that to you. Maybe you can oh throw that God, in the that's video. That's hilarious, dude. Like, uh, there's no faking it. Yeah, right. Are, are, are you ready to engage in rock-based content? Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. Like, that that's that's that feels like that's what we're the internet has enabled us to not put out like meaningful creations how you and I talk about it but like I don't want to get good at a skill yeah. I don't want to spend my time on this skill I'd rather just uh, engage in rock based content instead of putting out rock and good rock and roll music <laughs> let's put together some rock based content I love that like if a band actually like that was their whole persona they just like dress but they're really really good though but like that's their whole shtick is like they look like they just got done working a nine to five <laughs> and then like are you ready for this rock based content but then it would be awesome music well it's so <laughs> you remember in the late 90s i graduated high school uh half a year early and so i went off to audio engineering school this is back when you actually would record this is 99 so uh reel to reel tapes right yeah and classic and well i i recorded for this jazz trio from uh, university or from Ohio State University. They would come down to Chillicothe, Ohio, which is where the school was. We had like six different studios there, and we we and I didn't learn anything there really that is still useful today because now we use like a you know a little recorder for the podcast. We don't need the the, the big Dr. Dre board or whatever. Um, but it was useful there because you had to mic up all the drum stuff. So we had this jazz trio, and they're like these college guys, and they have these like khaki shorts on and tucked in polo shirts nice. with a little horse logo on them. That's great. And they're playing the jet and it's re- they're really good, right? Mm-hmm. But their side project for school mm-hmm. was a death metal band. I love it. And it was called the Priest Murderers. That's great. It <laughs> makes me think of uh, uh, Alexis on Fire or Alexa on Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. City in Color. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, that's that's great, dude. Yeah, uh, Alexis on Fire, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. it is, yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah, the City in Color sort of came out of that. Right. Um, but... 
it was it was like this there was this dissonance like you'd hear the music you hear the and it was death metal you know the the crazy death metal and by the way death metal good good death metal whatever that means um requires significant uh amount of proficiency I yeah mean, sean's a drummer he can attest to that trying to do the death metal drums i mean it's like i mean it's crazy yeah. and like I mean, it, it's, it requires a lot of grunting and screaming into a microphone, but the but you actually have to have good vocals though to do. To, yeah, to I, I think so. Be a lead singer in the band, like yeah, that. yeah. And so uh, when when I think about what they were creating there, like it, there was this dissonance, and that's what that that cartoon was like. It's like uh, they were creating death metal content. Yeah. In a way, like it was just a side project that was fun for them. Like they didn't take it seriously. In fact, it was kind of a gag for them yeah. to show, hey, we're really good at music. We can be a jazz trio, or we can be death uh, metal. Yeah, we can be death metal. And so, uh, yeah, they were using their time to sort of shape multiple skills there. The next, uh, the, the next one, and this th this is one that you and I have talked about, and I've realized it recently, especially since I've been talking about my health problems. I've gotten a lot of energy back recently. Yeah, that's the next one. Energy is the next most precious resource. We often live our lives as if we're a deflating balloon, bouncing aimlessly from our inboxes to our television sets to our social media profiles, allowing other people's priorities to dictate our actions. It feels productive to be busy, but meaningful tasks rarely reside on our to-do list. If we focus our energy wisely, though, then we can float purposely through life. Otherwise... We're just deflating. Yeah. I think sometimes, like, especially when we have limited amounts of energy, it feels easier to mm. like, well, I'm just going to, I'll just be on the inbox or I'll watch the TV or whatever. Like, I'll expend less energy. But you're still expending the energy. You, right. you have only so many waking hours. And how we use that energy is really important. If, and the other word that you might want to use for that instead of energy is focus. What am mm. I focusing my energy on? And it requires more energy to be focused, but that's how you get something meaningful. Yeah. And, and that line there of meaningful tasks rarely reside on our to-do list. Sean, you can put that as minimal maximum in the show notes. Uh, the next one is one we always talk about, attention. I think it's the most precious resource, or it's certainly up there. In a world filled with glowing screens, pop-up ads, and multi-platform media, everyone is vying for access to our ever-contracting attention spans. Advertisers have figured out that the shortest route to your checking account is by way of your attention. So they'll do almost anything to grab it. I mean, you think about all the, the pop-ups and the bottom pop-ups. and the I mean, they'll do anything to get the attention. How do I get eight seconds of your time? Yeah. I need it right now, right? Yeah, that's crazy. But maybe these corporations are reckless with our attention because we are so careless with it ourselves. Amen, dude. That's yeah. We are. Uh, we we as a society allow these tactics to work, and because we allow them to work, the corporations continue to use these tactics. I totally agree with you, man. Yeah, absolutely. And so, if we want to live deliberately, we mustn't squander our mind share on every interruption. So it's best to subscribe, to mute, and to walk away from anything that's not adding value to our lives. Yeah. And the reason I'm, I'm reading this essay for Elise here is she has, you know, her question is about living a more deliberate life and getting past the stuff. And I think it starts with the stuff because the stuff takes up so much of our attention. Yeah. Not just the stuff that we have that we have to take care of. Right. But the stuff that we think about bringing into our lives and shopping and the neuroses. I mean, uh, Bex is, is buying a new car right now. And I, the, the, the time and the patience that really goes into uh, making sure that you get the car that's going to last for the next five to ten years. Right. And, and, and making sure you take it to – she's taken a couple to mechanics and it just doesn't check out or whatever. And mm -hmm. um, and, and in doing so, like, it's a very deliberate purchase. But you want that – you want to be deliberate with it now. I'd rather spend 40 hours on that purchase now than live for the next four years with a terrible purchase, with a bad decision. Yeah, right? absolutely. Or trying to dig yourself out of the hole. And the last uh, resource here is money. Mm-hmm. Although we often think of money as the ultimate resource, it is the least important of the five herein. Money won't necessarily improve your life. It merely amplifies your existing behaviors. If you have bad habits, more income will make your life considerably worse. I mean, uh, you think about like uh, the people who win the lottery, right? And all of a sudden they're dead or in jail or broke in Dude, a my couple e years. Dude, my ex-father-in-law... Uh -huh. He was a president of a bank in Ohio. 
mm-hmm. a, a, a chain of banks. I don't know how many locations they had, but over twenty. Yeah, he told me that in his tenure as president of that bank, he saw I think it was five. It was five or six people win the lottery, and one of them, one of them did not go bankrupt. And that has to do with habits. Yeah. So if you have good habits and you win the lottery, you can do some really great things. And, right? the, and well, and the the one example that didn't go bankrupt, he said, you know what their secret was? They didn't change anything about their lives. They just continued to live the same lives right. they had already built for themselves. And that's the amplification I'm talking about here. So, and if you're already a generous person, then money can help you be more loving, caring, yeah. and considerate. Yep. And then there's a little PS here at the bottom. You could rejigger our acronym as MEATS, M-E-A-T-S, which would be funnier and perhaps more memorable, <laughs> but let's avoid putting money first. <laughs> And I think that's the that's thing good, to think man. about. Like, too often we put like, we think about money as the ultimate resource, and yeah. and it's not necessarily so. For Elise, the thing that that I that I would say is, yeah, I struggled with meaningful management and prioritization of my most precious resources. I put money first for a long time, mm. and I didn't think about developing my skills. I, there would always be time to do that in the future, or mm. I I was careless with my attention. I was careless with my energy. Mm. I was I was careless with with my resources because I pretended as if they were just infinite or I'd get to it someday in the future. Yeah. You know, out of all these resources, man, it's, I just had this thought that, so out of these five resources, time is the one that we all have in common. We all have 24 hours in a day. Yes. Now, you know, some of us will live longer lives than others. I get that. But as far as the time goes, we all wake up. We have, we have that time. Yes. Um, if we spend that time, if we spend it to d- with good habits, um, we uh, like healthy habits specifically. I was yeah. thinking, this leads to more energy yeah. and more time potentially. Right? If you live in a healthy life, you'll get more time. Hopefully, yes, exactly. So yeah, so healthy lifestyle. Yeah, it'll give you more time. It gives you more energy. Yeah, absolutely. And having more energy will allow you to have more attention. Mm. Yeah, because what that energy is what you focus on, and if you're focused your energy, then your attention is going to be yeah. better used. And then your attention, if you use it right, you can really develop some really awesome skills. Yes. And then yes. If, if you develop these skills to a point where you're adding value to a lot of people's lives and you're really, really good at these skills, well, then you might be able to make money from it. Yeah, you're gonna, you're, it, your skills will ultimately help people solve problems. I, dude, I, 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 I mean, the because of the acronym, it's not in that order, but um, that is... Uh, I think you just uncovered the meaning to life here, Josh. Or not not, not the meaning to life, but the uh, a formula for for living a meaningful life. Yeah, I, I, th- I think so, man. I think and th- this is based off of many conversations you and I have had and uh, just trying to get it out there in a way that's memorable and, and yeah. thinking about those resources. No, that's, I so, think it's beautifully put, man. So, yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> as far as my struggles go, man, um, God, I, I, dude, I struggle with stuff every day still. Mm. Like, I struggle with addiction, man. Like it is, um, I'm, I'm an addictive person. Mm-hmm. Like it, it would be very easy for me to drink a half a bottle to a bottle of Jameson every single day. Probably not a whole bottle, but, but you know what? If I, if I started with a half a bottle, I'd probably get to a bottle eventually. Yeah. You'd work your way up to it. Yeah, man. Um, narcotics, God, dude, narcotics sure do make you feel good. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like a really nice, easy, quick fix. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, like the, the, when I say I struggle with those things every day, um, it might, it might, because I had struggled with that stuff so much in my past, it might be something where, um, you know, I'm thinking about relationship with my dad or something. And it's like, man, you know what, if I could just take a pill right now, that would really mm-hmm. just kind of like mask all that pain or, um, uh, on the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, drinking is something that I, I'd love to celebrate with a drink. Well, <clears throat> celebrating with 10 drinks is, is definitely not healthy, but I, but if I, if I did not have limitations if i didn't have good habits then these these things could certainly end up being a problem Um, because i think you're talking about the residue of of the past too and that that always carries forward so what you're talking about is you're talking about some past habits that have changed right and so so you well well, what i understand is like in order for for me to keep my life clear of clutter it also means keeping my mind clear of clutter Mm. And those things, um, especially narcotics, do not add to the clarity. It, it, it makes it more cluttered, if anything. Right. I right. mean, I, I, uh, Doctor Green last night when we were when we were all having dinner, he showed us that picture of the dude 
who um, I forget his name uh, from Mighty Ducks, but he's like the goalie in Mighty Ducks. Yeah. And he was like this, you know, chubby, fat, like cute kid who was a goalie in this movie, in this right. kid's movie. And he just got arrested not too long ago for a DUI. Yeah. And he looks like my grandfather. He looks like the result of a, of a l- long lived hard life. Yeah. And, and it's not even that. It's long because it's painful. Right. Um, and, and what you're talking about. And th- there's no judgment here. No. It's just a matter of... You're identifying. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I, I struggle with too, man, is, dude, I always want to buy new stuff. I wish I could sit here and say, hey, listen to our podcasts, read our books, yeah. and uh, you will never want to buy anything again, ever. You will be you will be free of this urge to buy stuff. That's just not the case, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like... Uh, and if I, anyone's telling you that, they're, they're, they're probably misleading you. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I think about... I know I talk about uh, uh, Mariah and I's Toyota Corolla a lot, but, you know, I'm saving money for a new car and I really want to buy a new Tesla. Like, if I stayed up for another two years, three years, I could probably have $60,000 to drop on a Tesla. Right. But the problem, though, is that... I don't have an ex- sixty thousand dollars is a lot of money for me, <laughs> a lot of money yeah. for a lot of people. But but my point is is that I'm not a uh, well going with Dave Ramsey's um, suggestion. Yeah, he says you know if you're if you're a millionaire, okay, you can afford to buy a new car. Yeah, if, if your net worth is more than a million dollars, you can afford to purchase a new car. Right. By the way, the <clears throat> average so that, that uh, Chris Hogan has that new book coming out in January called Everyday Millionaires. Yeah. And they did a, a, the most comprehensive study of millionaires uh, throughout the, the uh, country mm-hmm. and, and more than 10,000 millionaires. And by the way, when we say millionaires, we're talking a lot of teachers and nurses. We're not talking about finance guys no. and, 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 and bankers and everyday and, people, everyday people. And, and a large percentage of them have made less than $60,000 a year their yeah, entire life. Absolutely. They've just made good decisions with the resources they have. Absolutely. But keep going with the Dave Ramsey thing. Well, so, what, and what he talks about with millionaires is like, you have a million dollar net worth, mm-hmm. then you're you're able to buy a new car. But your average millionaire drives a car that is three years old or <laughs> older. Right, because millionaires then become millionaires by buying a new car every year. Yeah, you don't become a millionaire but, by spending <clears throat> your money. But but you know, uh, to to Elise's question here, she asks, you know, how you know what kind of tools do we use to help us through these these problems we have. And like Dave Ramsey, he's one of those guys. Like I, the, the books that he that he has, the radio show, whatever it may be. Like that's a tool that I use to help keep myself in check. So yeah, like if I was if I had a net worth of a million bucks, still would be very hard for me to drop that type of money on a car. Mm-hmm. But at least, <clears throat> at least I could like. Here's what I envision: if you know, if if you and I ever you know become millionaires, um, if I drop sixty thousand dollars on a car, I would have to drop sixty thousand dollars on building schools in Laos. Right. But right now, I'm not in a position to where I can I can take one hundred twenty thousand dollars and divide it up like that. Right. So so because of these uh, principles, because of these tools that I use, like no, I'm not going to go out and buy a Tesla. Right. Like I, I've been talking about buying a Tesla for a couple of years, I, I ain't going to do it now. I mean, unless unless I have an expendable income yeah someone drops uh, 10 million dollars <clears throat> on on your lap yeah. Here, here's the thing you you and i are like for example we're helping build the grocery store you and i are donating over twenty thousand yeah. dollars of our own money and i would rather do that than have a tesla yeah 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 and and yeah you could like hoard that money and say well i'm going to uh and, and it'd be okay it's your yeah. money you do whatever the hell you want with your money yeah and i'm not tr- like this is not me virtue signaling uh, and i'm not trying to make anyone feel bad out there for owning a tesla i just want to be very clear on that um, I'm just answering Elisa's question on the problems that I have mm-hmm. and and how I'm able to overcome those problems that I have. But it is through reasoning like this. It's through different tools that help me to keep good habits. Because emotionally, it's really easy to say in the moment, man, that'd be great. I, I could figure out a way to afford the monthly payment on a Tesla or, or whatever, right? Yeah. And, and, and Oh, I could afford the payment. Right. You just can't afford the car. Right. <laughs> 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 there are two more cartoons I wanted to share with you, Ryan. Oh, I um, love cartoons. So so this is another New Yorker one. Jordan, I'll give this to you afterward. You want to describe what this says? Before, you, before it says what it says, just describe the room. All right, there's a woman walking through. It looks like an apartment door. She has a scolding look on her face, and there's a dude sitting in the middle of a empty room, hardwood floor, sitting on a chair with a smirk. So she's yelling. He's smirking in an empty room. You and came the- early. Wait. Go ahead. <clears throat> the caption says, you came home early just so you could get the chair. 
Oh, that's great. So dude. I think people often think of minimalism like this, <laughs> this cartoon, right? Like, are you, this is, yeah, dude, but that, yeah, this is deprivation though, man. Exactly. And so <laughs> that's the thing that I want to, to communicate here with Elise is, yeah, you'll struggle with certain things, but this isn't the answer. Mm-hmm. Having the house with nothing in it is not what we're going for. I mean, mm-hmm. you were at my house last night and there were six of us there. We had a, a table with six of us eating. We all had our it. own plate. Yeah. We all had our own seat. Almost. <laughs> uh, I was well. Isn't that why you were sitting on my lap? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, but but I still had a seat. I could have used if I wanted so, to. Jordan, if you want to put that on on camera somehow, oh, right, I'll hand see, it over to you. But hold on. Let, so so oh. with Elise, uh, keep that in mind. Like, as you're letting go, yes, the decluttering of the stuff is not the end result because that would be your end result. In fact, then you had to get rid of the chair. That's too much stuff, right? Yeah. Why do you have a chair? You're not a real minimalist without a chair. Well, you know what's funny, man? I just had this thought pop into my head. Like We always talk about how someone could rent a dumpster, throw away all their stuff, and still be miserable in an empty apartment. Right. Like The the the, the minimal the, the the exciting part of minimalism, mm-hmm. it is the journey. Like it is fi- it is taking this tool and it's helping one to figure out exactly what adds value to their life. And like that process, the process of doing that, like that is, that's the fun part. Yeah. Having, having an empty room with just a chair in it, like that's not much fun or meaningful for that matter. Right. Well, for, for most people. And, but if you want to live that way, I think of our friend Colin Wright, yeah. who's out on t- getting ready to go out on tour right now, the Becoming Tour. <laughs> I think it's becomingtour.com. He's doing 26 cities in this next year. But for the last two years, he's lived in an apartment they, because he's focused on creating his podcast. Right. And he was renting an apartment in Memphis for the last year. And he got you know the, ba- the basics. He had a desk and a chair. I'm sure his house... His apartment looked fairly similar to that with a few other accoutrements, right? Yeah. And and in doing that, that's what was appropriate for him. He mm-hmm. didn't he didn't like having company over and like so he had what worked just for him yeah. in his own space. And that's fine. And now that he's he's getting ready to leave, he had to even get rid of some of the stuff. So I'm guarantee his apartment looks really similar to that right now. And I'm gonna this is the third and, and final cartoon, but this reminds me this cartoon <laughs> reminded me of Elise. When I was thinking about her question, I saw this cartoon and I was like this is where Elise is right now. Um, uh, of course, you know Alice in Wonderland, right? Yes. This uh, The title of this one at the top says, Alice in Responsibility Land. <laughs> and she's coming home. So there, there's her. She's walked into her kitchen. Yeah. And everything that is there, it, it's like uh, the door says, lock me. And the umbrella says, put me away. And the food on the counter says, cook me. And the dishes in the sink say, wash me. And the freezer says, defrost me. And the fridge says, fill me. And the window says, look through me. And the email on the computer says, check me. And the plates on the table say, clear us. And the wow. the bottle of alcohol on the table says, don't drink me. And the cupcake on the table says, don't eat me. And the bills on the table say, pay us. And the, the purse in her hand says, put me down. And the chairs on her or at her kitchen table say, wipe us down. And the floor says, sweep me. That is a genius cartoon, man. And that is le- so good. And, and we get overwhelmed with these responsibilities. And for mm-hmm. me, minimalism is a way not to remove Mm-mm. the responsibilities. I'll give this to you, Jordan, so you can put that in. No, it's a way to choose. Well. Yes, it's the, way, it's the way to pick better responsibilities. Yeah. What am I going to be responsible about? Because we all have to be responsible to something and someone why not choose those deliberately instead of just having to deal with the next responsibility that fills our life? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Elise, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Sean, if you could reach out to her and send her the audiobook version. If you like the the podcast, then you'll probably like the audiobook version of this. It's a relatively short book. It's like two and a half hours long. It's our shortest book. And uh, it goes over the five values. The one thing that we didn't talk to you about is identifying, getting really focused on what your values are. Because, Elise, you said you want to be focused and value-driven. Dr- value and if you want to be value driven, well, then you better be driven by the right values because yeah. it's possible to not have the right values that are going to move you forward. And then you're going to be like that deflating balloon that we talked about. So we'll give you the audiobook version of that. Or if you want the book, book version or the ebook version, we'll be happy to give you a copy of Live a Meaningful Life in any of those formats. Our next question is from Emma in Mammoth Lake. Mammoth Lake. I got to get up there and snowboard this season, Mariah and I. Yeah, that's like... uh, I hear it's amazing. Yeah, well, I've never been, but we'll make it up there. Mammoth Lakes, California. I spent a year working in corporate America, and that was enough for me. 
Um, I suffered through it. I toughed it out. I'm a hard, dedicated worker. I wanted to do a good job at my job, and I did a fantastic job. Uh, the company did not want me to leave when I gave them my notice, but I told them I had to do this for my health and uh, my mental sanity. I knew that what I was doing was not good for me, and I knew that what I was doing was not cultivating my passion. So how does someone step back into their discomfort zone after being in their comfort zone for a period of time because of how uncomfortable a job was? So how do you step back into the discomfort zone, so to speak? I love that question, man. And, and you know, I've, I've... Good for you, Emma, seriously. Like, that is awesome. Yeah, because what happens is if we get too comfortable for too long, we, we I mean, there there's a parody of the couch potato. You know, you think of, like, I don't have a New Yorker cartoon to describe it, but you could imagine what it would look like. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, uh, it's the couch potato literally eating a bag of potatoes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there's no real growth in that other than our waistlines. Well, contentment does not does not lead to creation. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That, That's that, pithy. Put that in the That is. Put yeah. that in the in the uh, right. yeah. But creation leads to contentment. Amen. Oh. Boom. Yeah, and so um I think I think the first thing you have to do is find what what is the edge of your comfort zone today, and it's going to be different for each one of us, right? Mm -hmm. What's the edge of your comfort zone, and step one step beyond that. I'm thinking about um, uh, I just got one of those those stationary bikes at home, right? Mm -hmm. And I I was going to my my initial objective this month was to ride it every day this month mm -hmm. uh, during the month of August. I decided to step back because on the seventh day I was in so much pain, like. Uh, I was like, I should probably take a one or two day break on this thing, <laughs> you know, because you're doing a soul cycle class literally every day it's crazy. Um, for a month. And so your body needs to rest. Yeah. My objective is if I can do it 15 times a month, still a lot, yeah. Yeah, 15 soul cycle sessions and yeah. in, in one month. But what do you do? I mean, you've been to a soul cycle class with me before yeah. you they have periods of high intensity. It's interval training, right? Yeah. You're really heavy for 30 seconds on. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Oh, my God. Am I going to make it? It's 20 seconds in. How am I going to go 10 more seconds at this uh, at this energy level, right? Yeah. But you figure a way to push through. But then what do you have? have? You have another. You have a 30-second break. It's on and off. So you find that edge of it's extremely uncomfortable to be doing that. But you're not going to do it in perpetuity because then you're going to break. You go too far beyond the comfort zone mm -hmm. and you break yeah. however if you find that edge and you push hard for those 30 seconds or whatever the equivalent is but then there's the moment of rest the step back into the comfort zone oh, like it's not it's not complete rest you're still pedaling and mm -hmm. your cadence is, is is lowered but you're still moving forward mm -hmm. your resistance is not zero but it's still some resistance there and that resistance actually helps us grow inside the comfort zone yeah. and it prepares us for that discomfort as well well and quite literally man like that's what exercise is about it's about giving yourself resistance so your muscles can grow mm -hmm. so you're you can have good cardiovascular health like growing in a healthy way like quite literally yeah. you have to have the resistance right yeah. and, and by the way it, there's you know we were talking about this on the health problems podcast that i did with with um uh chris and and, and dr wood um when we were talking about some of my health problems but when people do you know some of the best sort of training is really high intensity and then backing off. You don't want to just go out and run for two hours straight right. at a medium pace. And and he was comparing that to the, the, the mental load, the medium cognitive load is what he called it, mm. uh, where uh, it, it's the opposite of what Cal Newport talks about with deep work, like really heavy focus for an hour or two a day. Mm -hmm. It's you know, nine or le level nine or 10. You can't do more than an hour or two of that. Right. Um, and there are a few exceptions. Fiction writers seem to be able to do three to five hours. Uh, a lot of them. Uh, yeah. But 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 for the most part, you have this heavy cognitive load. But then you have to back off and you have to go look at a tree or something for a while. Uh, something that doesn't require that that heavy cognition. Yeah. And I think the same is going to be true here for Emma. And uh, is is you're going to have to find that discomfort and then. Whatever that is, it's a step beyond the comfort zone. It's not pain. Don't confuse 
discomfort with pain. There right. are two different things. We don't mm. want you to suffer. We want you to get a little bit uncomfortable. That's where you're going to grow. Yeah, going with your bike analogy, it's like being on the bike is uncomfortable. Yeah. But then it started to become painful right. when you weren't on the bike. Yeah. And there's a clear distinction where you're like, oh, like this is not growing. This is hurting. It's not good for me. Yeah. Right. So hurting is not growing. That's another that's another beautiful minimal maxim there, podcast Sean. <laughs> I uh man, you know, I, I want to encourage Emma to start small. Um she's gotta practice getting back into her discomfort zone. Mm-hmm. So does that mean, you know, going to the gas station and asking for a ref- uh, free refill on her gas? Does that mean public speaking? Does it mean writing uh you know that first song and singing it in front of you know her partner or friend i don't know what that means for her but my point is is that she can find these fairly banal experiences that have no real negative consequences exactly you not fail at them. yeah not banal benign is benign, the word. benign yes. is what i meant so these fairly hopefully they're not banal yeah hopefully they're not they, uh, benign can be banal <laughs> but doesn't necessarily have to be but yeah you can find these benign experiments these these way to practice kind of being in your discomfort zone emma and the more you practice, the better you get at it. Um, there, I, I love the talk. Uh, Jia Jiang, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, he talks about his story with practicing failure. I know I've recommended this before on a podcast, like several, several podcasts ago. But we saw him mm-hmm. at um, the World Domination Summit. I think it was back in 2000. And it must have been 2013, huh? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, he just does a really good job of talking about how he doesn't talk about practicing uh, being uncomfortable what he talks about is practicing failure mm-hmm. but he gives an amazing talk about how he went out and tried to fail on purpose so he could get comfortable with it mm-hmm. and uh, i think it's a very uh, appropriate talk for emma where um, she could translate his advice on failing on practicing failing to practicing being uncomfortable right yeah. right yeah and, and the other thing that i'm thinking about is so she left the corporate world right yeah. Uh, she left that corporate job, something she wasn't passionate about, and she might be struggling with finding her passion. Mm-hmm. And so I have this article from The Atlantic. Uh, it's called Find Your Passion is Awful Advice, which is very suspiciously similarly titled to an essay that I wrote five years ago. Dude, there is... It's um, a compliment. Yes. It's a very good compliment. Um, and But it's actually... what I mean, My guess is the author actually didn't did not... Generally, with with articles like in and and uh, organs like the Atlantic, the author does not get to pick their own title. Oh, I got gotcha. you. There's some editor somewhere that picks a title. Yeah. Um. Uh, anyway, we did an interview with uh, Cal Newport. It was called "Follow Your Passion Is Shitty Advice." Right. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, but also we'll put a link to this. I just wanted to to read the beginning of it, um, to to maybe point you in the right direction here, Emma. Uh, Carol Dweck, a psychology professor at Stanford University, remembers asking an undergraduate seminar recently, how many of you are waiting to find your passion? Almost all of them raised their hand and got dreamy looks in their eyes, she told me. (laughs) They talked about it, quote, like a tidal wave would sweep them over. Sploosh, huzzah, it's accounting. And that's the thing. Like, I mean, very rarely does someone say, I found my passion. It's accounting, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, although we, we've talked about Connor, our accountant. He seems to be really passionate Dude. about accounting. Um, would they have unlimited motivation for their passion? They nodded solemnly. <laughs> I hate to burst your balloon, she said. It doesn't usually happen that way. The article goes on to, to cite a bunch of studies and references. I'm going to well, uh, have Sean put a link to it in the show notes, but let's talk about sounds it. Sounds great, man. Well, yeah, it's like the reason why everyone's nodding their head like, yes, I'm always going to be motivated is because we do have this saying in Western society about how if you find something you love to do, you never have to work a day in your life. And there's somebody out there who's probably like, yeah, that's my life. And I, I get up and I don't feel like I ever have to go to work and I love what I do. But that is a Jordan's over there raising his hand, you know, and, 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 but Jordan is an exception to the rule, right? Like that is not, that is not the rule. And yeah. it, 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 going back to the expectations that we set for ourselves, like that expectation can really be detrimental to us. Definitely. It's, it's not, it, it, it's, it is, uh, it's not good to have that expectation. And I'm arguing that having that expectation is actually really, really harmful to someone. It is because it presupposes that you were born to be a nurse or an astronaut or an Mm -hmm. accountant or whatever it may be. There is not one thing that is going to be a passion. And by the way, the thing that you're, if you do find something that you can cultivate into a passion, Mm -hmm. 
you may not be passionate about it for the rest of your life. Yeah, absolutely. It may pivot or it might change altogether. For me, fiction writing was was the 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 prime example. I, I'm still really passionate about writing, mm -hmm. but I always thought like that's what I would do for the rest of my life. When I left the corporate world, like fiction writing was the thing, and then uh, that that's what I wanted to do. And I haven't, in earnest, written any. Published any fiction since 2012, yeah, and I haven't written a whole lot that's publishable since then. Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't honestly say, well, I'm a fiction writer because I don't yeah. write fiction, right? Uh, I and it's not the thing I'm curious about anymore. It is a thing I was really curious about in my 20s, and I followed that curiosity. But guess what? That curiosity led me down a different path to another curiosity. But if I were to f have found my passion, then it'd be something I could never leave. And yeah. I couldn't be doing this right now. I couldn't be helping people solve their problems via a different medium, whether it's podcasting or writing on a blog or making our next documentary. I couldn't do that if I was so fixed on, yeah. well, I've already found my passion. You, you know, or something worse might happen too when we have that expectation we find something that we really like we really enjoy doing mm -hmm. like writing for example and then all of a sudden you get to a point where you're like man this feels like work oh yeah. i must not really be passionate about it yeah i mean so having that expectation of i find something i love i get up i don't work a day in your life and then you find something you like and then you realize like oh wow this is a little bit of work it could you know make someone just shrug off that time and the energy that that uh they wanted to put into that passion mm. but you know just realizing that yes you are going to have to work like you are going to dude you and i i i there's not anything else i'd rather be doing like mm. what we're doing is is amazing and i wake up every day grateful for it yeah. and I, I still feel like there are days where like we work our asses off well I, it reminds me on our we did a, a patreon live stream we do a monthly uh, patreon live stream for the patrons and one of the questions on the last one was about if you had a year left to live, what would you do with that year? What, what would you do differently? And it's actually a question I've asked myself since tw 2011. Yeah, um, that's a, yeah. And I wouldn't do anything differently because I'm already living my life how I would live it if I just had the rest of this year left to live. Yeah. Now, would I maybe adjust some particulars and move some stuff up around? Y yes, but the end result of the year would be would be the same. And you and I had this conversation like, what the hell happened in 2006? <laughs> and, and it was like, I don't really remember what happened in 2000. Was that the year that the promotion or was yeah. that the, I don't remember. And, and you were like, well, there was alcohol and drugs involved, but I, that wasn't just 2006. And, yeah. and like, the point is like now, ever since making this decision, living, living life one year at a time, because I don't have some grandiose 10 year plan. Like, well, here's where I'm going to be 10 years from now. No. I know what we are going to focus on for the next year because you and I talk about it. We have these conversations. We're going to grow together this way. Mm -hmm. And we adjust accordingly, mm -hmm. but we know what we're going to do. But we can also look back and say, hey, remember in 2010 when we started the website? Do you remember in 2011 when we published our first book? Do you remember 2012 during the Holiday Happiness Tour? Yeah. Do you remember 2013 when we moved to Missoula and started a publishing company? Do you remember 2014 when we did the 100 City Tour? Do you remember in 2015 when we did the Word Tasting Tour and finished uh, filming the documentary? Do you remember in 2016 when we released our documentary? Yeah. Do you remember in 2017 when we started? Yeah, and, and you have all of these different... Each year we have this thing that we can look back on and say, oh, our resources our time our attention our money mm -hmm. um our, our energy skills, yeah yeah it was all focused on on this major project everything else sort of focused on that and so we're doing something meaningful because we did focus on it yeah. and and i think that's where where emma has to be right now is how is she going to use those resources don't don't wait around to find your passion it's find your curiosity mm -hmm. what are you interested in right now mm -hmm. and then and then move in that direction we really need to come up with a new set like i want to rephrase the if you find something you love to do you never work a day in your life. Let's try and rephrase that right now. So maybe the saying should be find something that you don't mind working towards. Yeah. There's something there, man. There's yeah. another saying that we have to start putting out into the world yeah, yeah, but, that, that just sets the right expectation of of uh, cultivating a passion's hard work. Right, right. Yeah. F finding something that... that um, find something that is worth working your ass off for so, yeah something like that I mean, we, yeah that's we, good man. We, can, we can work toward something pithier yeah but. here you pick pick the best pithy uh the best pithy tweet there podcast sean and, and put yeah. that out there and add four m dashes to it <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, all right. So uh, I think that's. Oh, I do want to give Emma a book because I think our book, Everything That Remains, will help her out. So it's my favorite thing that we've ever written. It's 12 different chapters about Ryan's and my journey from being the deflating balloon sort of successful in the corporate world but then also walking away from something that that was no longer meaningful to us but not just walking away but walking toward a more meaningful life and and so the recipe that we went through and it's uh, two sections it's the everything section and the remains section getting past the everything part and that that started with the stuff and then also the relationships and and the corporate world and the 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 wrong kind of drudgery and moving forward to the right kind of drudgery yeah and and being willing to spend our resources in a better way so sean if you reach out to her give her the audiobook version of everything that remains um or if she wants the book book or the ebook we're happy to give you those as well and for everyone else we'd love to hear what you have to say so if you have a comment or a tip about challenges or struggles that you've had then or including advice for any of our callers today Leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. And stay tuned to the end of this episode for this week's listener comments and tips. Ryan, what time is it? It's time for our lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to act like you're getting shocked right now. Oh, yeah. If you're not watching this on YouTube, then Ryan is doing something with his hands. I- <laughs> Is he? He's petting some large animal that's trying to get away from him. <laughs> I can't wait to see what, what Jordan does with that. <laughs> Please don't spend too much time on his nonsense. He's gonna. He's gonna put two dogs right here. I'm just <laughs> petting them. All right. Yeah. The lightning round. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the Minimalists. Uh, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I each do our best to answer every question, which is a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We'll also put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can sh- copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our quotes in one place, thanks to our good friend Jessica Lynn Williams over at minimalmaxims.com. You know, she relaunched her podcast this week. Oh, Jessica nice. Did. She handles all of our social media. It's called Tada. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> no, no, not like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you should do the promo for it. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so she's doing a podcast with her friend Melissa uh, on the other side of the pond called yeah. The Mind Palace. And she is, she's doing it on her own now, and she's interviewing different people every week. And it's called Ta-da! So you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts. Where's our first lightning round question from, Ryan? Our first lightning round question is from Chris. Chris writes in, is procrastination always a bad thing? Sometimes I need to walk away from a project before returning to it with a fresh perspective. And I, I totally get this, man. Yeah, I get it too. Here's, here's my first pithy answer. I have two for Chris, and then we can talk about it, Ryan. Don't let your amateur procrastination turn pro. Boom. Yeah, I think... Uh, uh, we, we can be, we can procrastinate, but then what happens with me sometimes if I put something off a little bit, I'm like, ah, I've already gone down the rabbit hole. I might as well just say, forget everything. I put it off for a day. I sh- I'll just put it off for a week. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and then it, it perpetuates until like I continue to put it off and you feel bad about it. And you realize that uh, and once you finally get to it, two, three months down the road and it took you an hour to finish this project, you're like, wait a minute. I've been worrying about this. I've had this psychological clutter for the last three months because I didn't, I wasn't willing to spend an hour getting this out of the way. Yeah. And so, yeah, think about that. The, the second short answer, the second minimal maxim I have for you, Chris, is a planned respite isn't procrastination any more than a, <laughs> than a planned car crash is an accident. I mean, if you plan to crash into a wall, that's not an accident. You did it on purpose. Right. And if you plan to take a, you know, a little break from something, that's necessary. It's, it's the interval training that we just talked about, right? Yeah, absolutely. My short answer is this. One can differentiate taking a break from procrastination by considering the amount of guilt they feel during downtime. For me, like this is key. Because there are some times when I need to take a step back from a project and really let some things digest, let some thoughts digest. But if I'm actually taking a break, I don't feel guilty about it. Right. When I, it becomes part of the process. The break is part of the process ex- sometimes. Exactly. But then there are other times when I am finding distractions. Mm-hmm. And as I'm you know, f- uh, following through with these distractions, I start to feel guilty because I'm like, oh, I should have been doing this. I should have been doing that. 
And that is where those are the, the, the signifiers that I look for in, in myself to really differentiate between am I, am I actually taking a break or am I actually uh, uh, ignoring this, this important task that I need to, I need to work on? And so maybe, may, maybe Ryan, that the distractions are related to pre- procrastination and maybe the intentional break is related to the project itself, related mm-hmm. to the creativity. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cal Newport talks about this in, in Deep Work when he talks about you know, spending time, you know, just like taking a walk. And in fact, if you look at Mason Curry's book where he talks about daily rituals mm-hmm. of, of creative people, <clears throat> whether it's David Foster Wallace or Mozart uh, and everyone in between, the, the two things that I notice in almost all of the, the people in this book, I think it's 163 case studies of different creative people, mostly writers, but not all of them. I noticed uh, some sort of caffeine consumption. <laughs> um, and I noticed daily walks. Oh, wow. Uh, and for most of them, I, I notice early, early working as well. Uh, not for all of them, though. There's some of them like uh, Hunter S. Thompson who... Yeah, I guess it was early. It was His writing didn't, yeah. started at midnight. That's yeah. really early. <laughs> yeah. The first hour of the day. That's crazy. All right, our next question is from Claudine. How can you be in a relationship with a person who collects stuff? All right, so so here's my pithy answer for you, and then let's talk about it. Find your breaking point mm-hmm. before you are broken. Yeah. And And what I mean by that is... There's an amount of hoarding that you're willing to tolerate, but there's also an amount of hoarding you're not willing to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Imagine there is some point you love Mariah. I don't believe in, I don't actually don't believe in unconditional love. There's always conditions. If she tried to stab you with a knife every morning, you would stop the relationship. Yeah. If she like joined the Ku Klux Klan, I would stop the relationship. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I don't think she could get in the Ku Klux Klan. Anyway, um, (laughs) <laughs> I don't think they would accept her, Ryan. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, there are there are there are conditions. Yes, yeah, and, and so um, at least can like well, you know, let's just unpack that for a second. Uh huh. So there are conditions to expressing love. Mm-hmm. Like if, if if Mariah somehow got into the Ku Klux Klan, they let her in. Yeah, they, she they, found a loophole. They, and they got didn't in. do the twenty three and Me test on her. Right, right. Um, then she went in with white face. Right, right. <laughs> Then, then I would still love her. Uh-huh. I, I mean, I still would like my heart, like my, yeah, like I, I my heart would still like go out to her. Uh-huh. But I could not express support for, you know, her interfering with other people's well being. Right. So, so yes, like maybe there is a such thing as unconditional feeling of love. Right. Right. But but there are conditions to me expressing my love towards someone. I think it's a great way to put it. Yeah. And so there would be a point where if she became a hoarder all of a sudden, like the kind of hoarders you see on TV, dead cat in the fridge, yeah. um, uh, um, pizza boxes strewn across the floor all the time. There is some point where you'd be like, I can't tolerate this anymore. Right. I can't even tolerate it. And so, but I, yeah, I, I would have many conversations leading up to that point though. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so, um, there is a point at which you would no longer accept the hoarding, mm-hmm. right? right? Now, you have to figure out, and I think Claudine has to figure out, what is that point? What right. is the breaking point for you? Because if you're past that breaking point, then the relationship is probably broken. Now, can you fix a broken thing? Of course you can sure. fix a broken thing. doesn't mean necessarily. You can't always put all the pieces back together. Right. And, and so where is that breaking point for you? If, if someone is... Uh, That's really pithy, by the way. Uh, you you can you can usually fix a broken thing, but maybe not put all the pieces back together. Yeah, that's good. Sean, Sean can edit that, make it work. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and I think that's the case. Even if it's someone who collects stuff, like you have to be able to, to accept and tolerate. I mean, having a five year old daughter with me, like what she likes to hold on to, mm-hmm. is definitely not. The, the thing I would like to hold on to. Now, ultimately, I get the final decision, but I'm not going to impose every preference that I have on a five-year-old. No, you're only allowed to wear monochrome clothing, right. Ella. Yeah, like, you can have only four toys. Purple dresses are stupid. <laughs> no, she gets value from those things, and so mm. I have to be willing to appreciate it. But there, there is a level wh- where I'm like, hey, you need to clean up your toys after you're done playing with them. They can't be there on the living room floor. Right. And, and so what is the level... That, that is the breaking point and let's let's avoid that breaking point and work together up into up into that that point i totally agree uh my short answer is this you can be in a relationship with a brick wall if you love and accept it enough the question to ask is how do our relationships align 
with a meaningful life. So Claudine, what I'm trying to say is this, is that you can absolutely live with a hoarder. Even if they have dead cats in the freezers, Claudine, you have to decide what that relationship does for your life. Hmm. And if accepting the cats in the freezer, if that means living a more meaningful life for you, Claudine, then that's great. Like no one's going to judge you for being with a person like that. But if, 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 if Claudine or anyone else out there is in a relationship where, where uh, people are, yeah, they got the cats in the freezers and like there's a, there's an obvious problem. Yeah. yeah. Try to fix the relationship. Try to try to uh, go out of your way to speak kindly to that person and ask them for support. But here's the key, man. In order for Claudine to get the support back, she has to make sure that she has been supportive to her partner. Yeah. So, so that's, that's really step number one. If you're looking for someone to support you, look in the mirror and ask yourself, how often have I gone out of my way to support this person that I'm asking for support from? Because what if they get value out of their collections? If they collect, yeah. if they, they collect angel statuettes, maybe they get immense value from that. Yeah. Then, then, then. And, and the question is, are you willing to tolerate that? There, for me, if I, I can, I mean, I love Bex, and I would probably put up with an angel statuette collection. Yeah, dude. Like if it really added value to her life, you yeah. would be like, you know what? That's silly. But I want to support you being happy. I right. want to support your preferences. Right. But there is a point where, I mean, obviously the dead cats in the freezer thing is like, that's a, I, I mean, I think Bex is super hot, but I even, I mean, I couldn't tell no, her. You, the, no, the yeah, but that doesn't mean freezer. Claudine couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just so, saying. So what are your, yeah. I mean, the, the question is like, what are the dead cats? I mean, there, there's a whole right. other level of things that I wouldn't, wouldn't tolerate in our relationship. Thankfully, I found someone who has similar preferences to me mm. and we, neither one of us collect anything. But that's how you develop good relationships, man. Yes. It's yeah. like you find people who you have similar preferences with. Do you have similar values, similar beliefs? Especially if you're living with that person. Now, yeah. my friends have radically different preferences and, and that's okay because I don't have to live with them. I don't have to right. deal with their stuff on a daily basis. We're able to have meaningful conversations. My friend Adam, who, who's moving, uh, his family's moving this this month. He sent me a picture of like their. You know, he's got four kids and a wife, and yeah. they're actually moving to a house that's the same size but different in terms of, of bedrooms and stuff. Um, they 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 show me a picture of this trailer. It looked all their stuff looked like a, a FEMA rescue trailer. I mean, <laughs> it was in all these organized bins and stuff. I'm like, are you helping like a bunch of families like, who have made it through a hurricane or something? But uh, that would drive me crazy sure. personally. But again, I, his life isn't mine. Right. And I can have a great relationship with him without, without, and here's the thing. Those are actually things that they need for their family. If I had that much stuff in my house, it would be inappropriate for my life. So maybe figuring out what is appropriate for you is going to help you identify the people that you can be in a relationship with, Claudine, and what, what that relationship looks like. All right. what are we, Oh, P.S. Ryan, we have one more question. Yeah, man. And that question is from Boro. Boro says, I want you to name three challenges that you like facing yeah so since we're talking about challenges today this was the perfect question so if you want to hear our answer to that question you can listen to this week's postscript episode over at the minimalists private podcast it's, it's available exclusively to our patreon supporters so if you want to support the show and keep this podcast 100 percent advertisement free then head on over to the minimalists.com slash support in addition to our weekly postscript episodes the minimalist private podcast feed includes our monthly ask the minimalists anything episodes unreleased recordings of our live events and the entire back catalog of past private episodes once you become a supporter you'll receive a personal link to our private podcast feed so it will play in the normal podcast player that you're listening to or you listen to this podcast to right now. And as a Patreon supporter, you also receive access to our monthly live stream videos as well as first access to tickets to all of our live events before those tickets are available to the general public. You can find all the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. And here is a snippet from this week's Postscript episode. Quite often we're going through a challenge. I think they're the same for me. Like we rarely enjoy them in the moment, mm. right? But we're grateful after the fact. Like when you and I, we write a book or even a blog post, like it's not always fun in the moment. It can be like you get to this point where it's like, oh, this is actually coming together. 
and yeah. it gets exciting eventually. But at the beginning, you're staring at, at the cursor on a blank page. Yeah. And that's like, oh, man, there's so much work ahead of me. A blank page? Yeah. And, and so I think that we're grateful after the fact because the result improves our overall well-being. Okay, now it's time for our added value portion of the show. This is where we each talk about something that has added value to our lives recently. Ryan, I sent you a, a link to an album. I sent it to Sean and Jordan as well. Um, this uh, new new band, I, they're not new. I guess they had an album come out last year. They're called Lovely the Band. Mm. It's all one word. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think they just want to name their band Lovely, but in the, the age of social media, Lovely was taken on all the social media, so they're at Lovely the Band oh on Instagram. Goodness. But they, that's crazy to think that social media, well, I guess websites, like they dictate right. what you, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. but their album, it's, it's definitely my top five right now of this year. I've not checked it out yet. It, it's, it out. it's called finding it hard to smile. Was it playing last night at all on the, when, no. when we were at your place? No, I was, that was an Aquilo playlist. Uh -huh. Um, but, uh, finding it hard to smile is the wrong title for this album. I, I would call it finding it hard not to smile this <laughs> album is like i've you catch me dancing there's something wrong but like i found myself like just moving to the album like what is going on my body won't stop moving <laughs> <laughs> but like and it's so well written some of the lines on here are just it's amazing it's a longer album too for like a it's sort of like a new new pop rock album but uh it's maybe 16 songs mm. and Every single song on the album is good. It is yeah. unbelievable. It's, it's. They're from LA. Actually, the lead singer is from New York, but they live in LA. And man, it is. It sounds like like Los Angeles, but like, it's like good. I don't even know how to describe it, man. It's just a really great album all the way through from the first song to the last song. It has been on repeat for the last week, week and a half for me. That's awesome. So check it out. It's called Lovely the Band, Finding It Hard to Smile. What's been adding value to your life recently, Ryan? Well, Josh, you know how I love to recommend albums that are a year old. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I just came across it, dude. You um, guys heard of Thriller? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, 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 I just discovered uh, Maroon 5's album, Red Pill Blues. Red Pill Blues. Uh -huh. Did you recommend this already? No, I didn't. I'm Could, not a Maroon 5 fan, personally. Me either. Yeah. Like, I, I don't, like, pop music in general, I don't go out and, uh, like, seek the newest, latest pop because it's usually singles. Uh -huh. Very rarely does a pop artist come out with an amazing album. And uh, they've done it, dude. Really? Yeah, you should check All it right. out. I you will would, check it out. You are, you you would dig it. But I always I, anytime you recommend something on this podcast, I always at least check it out. It so. is a it is a it is a it's a great album. Uh, good lyrics and see, I do Mariah and I do, you know, we do dorky dances in the kitchen when we're making dinner or whatever, dude. Yeah. And like we've been dancing in this album for like the last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be walking out. We were walking to dodgeball the other night. And like we're like d dancing down the street, dude. It was so good. It's so that good. That is good. Well, Sean, maybe we'll end this episode with the the lead single from uh, Lovely the Band's album. It's called Broken. Although if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll just put a link to the like. Uh, there's probably a picture in picture thing you can do with their video. It's a really good video too. The the song is amazing. Yeah, it's called Broken. All right, let's move on to right here, right now. This is where we talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. And speaking of YouTube, we've got a whole bunch of YouTube stuff going on. First off, if you want to leave a comment on this episode, I found that the best place to leave a comment on a podcast episode for us is on YouTube. And here's the thing. YouTube comments usually suck. Like, I don't ever they're read awful. Them. Except for whatever reason, you all have been awesome with respect to our YouTube comments. They're either they're, they're like conversational or they're helpful. Or you talk about the lighting or 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 um, there was a sound issue with the last video that we uploaded, and so we mm. had to delete it. And when we found this out, because people are, are, are commenting on it, oh. and so um, and we had to re-upload it. And, and Jordan had to spend a whole a whole Monday going through. Um, the, the pain of, of, of re-uploading a video. Um, 
But anyway, you can leave a comment about the episode, and we make sure that we, we read all of those. You can also interact with other people who are commenting. If, and if you have additional comments that you just want to, to leave and you're scared to call in for some reason, uh, calling in is always the best thing to do because you'll, you'll, we'll air it at the end of this episode. But you can also comment on the episode on YouTube on this particular episode. Mm-hmm. Also on YouTube, uh, you can find the full po- podcast episodes on Mondays. That's a day before the audio podcast comes out on Tuesdays. Also, new pre-roll episodes on Tuesdays, sort of behind the scenes of of the podcast or show prep for the podcast. You can uh, you can check that out every Tuesday. We're doing it live, so right around close to 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Pacific time on Tuesdays. You can find it live, or you can find the the video once it's uploaded as well. Also, new living room conversations. Living room conversations. <laughs> so we were going to change the name of this. We we put up a poll and said, "All right, we're thinking <laughs> of changing the name because sometimes we record it not in a living room." Right. Um, and uh, someone left like the profound comment, the uh, what the the faux found comment mm-hmm. of like. Man, if you're live in a room, isn't it a living room? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's great. And I appreciate that. So we put up a poll on YouTube and said, hey, we're thinking about changing the name. Do you want us to keep it the same as Living Room Conversations? Do you want to make it difficult conver- conversations? Because we do, we, we have difficult conversations about questions that aren't difficult to us anymore. But I realize why they're di- people are asking these questions because they're having a difficult time with it. Yeah. So difficult conversations. Or the other one was like, that's a great question because that's that's always like the filler that we that people yeah. bring up. Like if we're trying to think about, I need to pause and think for three seconds about this question. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks yeah. for asking that's a, it. That's a great name for a podcast, dude. It is. <laughs> so you all are welcome to use that if yeah. you want. But we're going to keep it living room conversations. We'll usually record it in my living room once a week. We're going to put those up on Wednesday starting this week. And then uh, new quickie episodes. So what we're doing... Uh, Jordan and I and and Jess have been working together to isolate uh, little snippets from the long podcast because we're recording this podcast today and I don't know how long it's been, an hour and a half, two hours, whatever it is. And and there's going to be like little three minute segments or 15 minute segments or eight minute segments that you can tweeze out. Uh, uh, here's an example. I went back and, you know, I did that three hour and 30 minute podcast with my doctors about my health problems. Yes. There's 26 quickie episodes within that podcast. Nice, man. So there's one where it's talking about being a vegan, but then eating meat as a, as medicine. Or there is a episode where we talk about our, uh, CBD, THC, and nootropics uh, from a doctor's perspective. Mm. And, and so instead of having to listen to full three hours on YouTube, you can find these little three or 20 minute clips That's great, and, man. and have those, have those right there for you in there. Cool. They're what I like about those. Those are more shareable. So people will find value in those in a different way from the podcast. We're also working on a uh, tour recap vlog. We were just on the simply Southern tour and, uh, and Jordan is working on pulling that together. I can't wait to do that, dude. That is going to be a lot of fun <laughs> doing it. People um, actually get to see what our, what our lives look like. Cause I mean, this question I hate, dude. I hate this question. <clears throat> so, Ryan, tell me about an average day in your life. What does an average day look like to you? That it like that presupposes a that we should have average days. Yeah, we should have this set day that we. Uh, oh well, from nine I get up at nine o'clock and I write for an hour and then I go surfing from ten to t- noon and then by one o'clock I'm back with my idea. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, and I hate that question. I'm projecting this hate uh-huh. because I don't have a good answer for it, yeah. dude. There is not a normal day. There you is can talk no- about an ideal day, but you can't have an ideal day every no, day. Right? No, but this vlog, like, when people start asking me that question, I'm just going to refer to them to look at the vlog. Yeah, so we're going to do a, a a monthly vlog called "Live a Meaningful Life," and it's talking about you know sort of a day in the life of the minimalist or a month in the life of the minimalist yeah. so it's it's the the josh and ryan show uh we're also going to do a behind the scenes thing for instagram tv ig tv um where it's not the josh and ryan show it's going to be all the work that goes in from the different parties whether it's podcast sean or jordan or jessica or dave or jeff all the people yeah, you'll get to see the inner workings of the minimalist team and yeah it's yeah. going to be called behind the minimalists i love it yeah it's kind of like behind the music this was this was jordan's idea that i think you and jordan came up with with nice that title name, man. um and and so uh we're also going to do some minimalism tips we're going to do a uh, this will be somewhere in the future, but on YouTube, we're going to do more minimalism tips. We're going to do home tours of Ryan's and my homes. We're going to do other YouTube shows and you can find all that and more over at our YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash the minimalists. And if you want our podcast in uh, podcast notes in your inbox, 
then you can, uh, you know, all the show notes, you always hear me say, hey, podcast, Sean, put that in the show notes. You can find all that uh, over at theminimalists.com. Just enter your email address at the top. We'll never send you spam. Dude, well, we should, though. We should, st- every time someone signs up with their email address, uh-huh. we should get their physical address and send them a can of spam. That would be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh i was gonna give you a health update maybe i'll do that next week we've been going quite long on this and i'll give you because i uh, I've, I've been experimenting a little bit with what i've been eating this month and i've introduced a few things back in slowly and a few things have screwed me up <laughs> so we'll talk about that next week hopefully uh have you checked out our side project it's called minimalism.life uh we well it, just go to minimalism.life <laughs> uh, we'll just say check that out you know what's funny is like minimalism i mean i know we're part of it mm-hmm but like what minimalism dot life is, mm-hmm. like it's better than what the like we as the minimalists I feel like because <laughs> it's like the minimalists are a piece of it yeah but it's it's just it's Voltron right yeah dude it's Voltron and, and it's and, yeah. and so yeah Carl and Alberto and then we have a bunch of people writing articles for it it's minimal, minimalism dot life you can also follow Carl and Alberto do a great job of, of curating the Instagram feed it's just at minimalism life on Instagram beautiful beautiful, beautiful photos yeah, but also meaningful quotes as well. I just find that at minimalism.life. Ryan, you got anything else for us today? Yeah, man. I got all these voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Our favorite part, man. Check them out. Hey, my name is Sarah. I am in San Francisco. Um, I'm actually calling because I was listening to the Acquaintance podcast uh, just now. I'm a stay-at-home mom with three kids, so plenty of time for that. And it's just so funny because the social media uh, friends thing is so relevant right now. Um, So last week... I still had Facebook, and a friend from high school that I have not hung out with really since middle school, let's say, but she went to my high school, um, wrote something that I felt was wrong, whatever, on Facebook, and I never respond because I hate those things. But I decided to unlike it because it was very offensive to uh, my life. And then I was like, you know what, I'll just unfollow her. She doesn't even know I'm following her anyway, but I didn't realize she saw my unlike thing. Anyway, I get this huge message on Facebook about um, how she can't believe I'm not her friend anymore because of this comment she said. So I just wrote back, like, hey, just so you know, like, I'm cool being friends. I uh, just didn't want to be your Facebook friend. So if that's cool with you. And then she kind of, like, was thrown off by that. We ended up having this really good conversation on there. Um, and then actually the next day I decided, you know, I'm just going to delete Facebook altogether. Um, kind of like I heard Ryan just us not having Facebook. So I don't have Facebook now. And it's so freeing. And it's so funny how quickly you find out who your real friends are. This is Kira, previously calling from California, but now I'm calling from Brooklyn and New York. And I just wanted to leave a tip about kind of detaching from that itch to be on your smartphone. Um, I've been noticing myself falling back into that pattern of just checking my phone all the time, whereas before I was able to create a limit and just check my phone maybe three times throughout the day. That's both text and email. And so I was rereading Josh's essay, Most Emergencies Aren't, kind of for inspiration and something that I have found helpful for me. Uh, if I, like, want to send a message right away and then my excuse to myself would be, okay, well, I am going to forget about this message, so I need to text it now, but then I open up my messages and then that opens a whole floodgate of things. I have a folder in the notes section of my phone called Messages to Send. So then I can write down the message that I want to send in there. And then later, if I still need to send that message, I'm actually sending it intentionally rather than on impulse. Hey, this is Jenna from Salt Lake City. Um, I was calling because I had a comment about your latest episode, um, the one on parents and uh, specifically on not getting along or um, having difficulties um, communicating and, and interacting in a, in a way that, that you would want the relationship to be. Um, I, okay, I grew up in a fairly religious family, um, and my mother has always been a really good example to me of this. Um, I've had several family members make decisions that uh, were contrary to what my parents' values were, and what I've seen from my mom is that um, she always follows the advice that she got from um, 
the movie Bambi, uh, Flower of the Skunk, uh, his mother would tell him if he can't say something nice, then he shouldn't say anything at all. And um, that is my mom. If she can't say something nice about something, she just won't say anything at all. But the other thing that she does, or the other things that she does, um, she'll find things that she agrees with this person on. And they'll talk about that. Or if they have common interests, they'll talk about that. And if she can't find something like that that's kind of a neutral topic to discuss, then she'll ask questions about that person's interests. What are you doing right now? How is your work going? How are your hobbies going? What do you do? You know, how's skiing? How's hiking? How's whatever you're doing? Um, she never volunteers advice. She will only give advice. And this pretty much goes across the board with all her kids. But she'll only give advice. If we specifically ask for it, she never calls us up and says, hey, I've been thinking about this problem, and I think you should do this, this, and this. She never, never volunteers advice. Um, I currently am dealing with a similar situation from a parental perspective. Um, We uh, adopted a child as a teenager, and their values are very different than ours are. And so there are some things, you know, house rules-wise, we don't want them to do drugs or whatever. But basically, I've followed the same sort of thing. If I can't say something nice, I don't say anything at all. I don't volunteer advice on her life choices unless she asks me. And she's 18 now, so that's less and less common. Um, But when we talk, we find things that we agree on. We talk about music a lot because we share the same um, same, uh, uh, likes and dislikes in music. So I hope that's helpful to you and to your callers. All right, y'all. That's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call. 406-219-7839. 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. And if you all leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Oh, yeah, and check out this song from Lovely the Band. It's called Broken. The Minimalists.